In this church, uh, the number one thing that we care about is loving God. That's what we're all about. That's why we're called Agape Bible Church, the word for love. We love the Lord our God with all our hearts, and we're always striving to increase our love for Him. And the way to do that is to focus our attention on what He's like, His attributes, the things that are true about Him. Do you enjoy doing that? Do you enjoy learning more and more attributes of God and, and gazing at them in further depth? Do you like that? Good. Here's one for you. How about this one? Acts 17:28. For in him we live and move and have our being. That points to an attribute of God. God is the author of life and the sustainer of life, and our living and moving and having our being is a wonderful gift from him. Amen? Now some, I think, may have hesitated a little on that particular amen, because your life right now just frankly doesn't seem like a wonderful gift at this point. It feels more like a curse. How do we reconcile the idea that life is a good gift from God with the reality that life is just battered with trouble and the curse in this fallen uh, feudal world? I mean, none of that problem exists in heaven. Heaven is better by far. If you know Jesus Christ and all your sins are forgiven through faith in him, uh, then, then going to the Lord is going to be better than this place by far. So why stay here? Why continue to be alive? Why keep going in a hard, painful, toilsome life? In what sense is this life here in this world a wonderful gift from God? that's worth having. Today Solomon's going to answer that question for us. We've been studying just verse by verse through the book of Ecclesiastes and we come today to chapter 9 which is a chapter designed to teach us how to enjoy life. The whole book is about how to enjoy life by pleasing God in the midst of a fallen world and this particular chapter is how to enjoy life by pleasing God in light of the reality of death. Uh, not so much how to deal with death or how to prepare for death but since death exists, how should we therefore live? So, verse, nine, uh, verse 2 in chapter 9, he starts right out talking about death, the fact that everybody dies. Everything is the same for everyone. There is one fate for the righteous and the wicked, for the good and for the bad, for the clean and the unclean, for the one who sacrifices and the one who does not sacrifice. As it is for the good, so it is for the sinner. As it is for the one who takes an oath, so for the one who fears an oath. This is an evil in all that is done under the sun. There is one fate for everyone. So he's just saying, we all die. He's not talking about the afterlife here. He's made that clear again and again in the book. He's talking about life under the sun, this life. The afterlife is a whole other story. You go to other places in Scripture to find out about this, that. But here he's saying, in this life, we all end up in the same place. We all end up in a box. Every one of us is going to die. At some point, you're going to work your last day, you're going to breathe your last breath, and you're going to think your last thought, and then it'll be over for you in this life. And the worst part of it is, not only will we all die, but we all die with having committed a whole lot of sins. Verse 3, in addition, the hearts of people are full of evil and madness is in their hearts while they live, and after that, they go to the dead. So we all die with sin, even good people, even the, even the righteous, people who are honest, even us, we, 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 we die with plenty of, having co co committed plenty of sins. And nothing can be done about that once death arrives. But, verse 4, there's hope for whoever is joined with all the living since a live dog is better than a dead lion. As long as you're still alive, there's hope. You can, things can change. So it's better to be, this, this comparison with a dog and a lion, I, it, most people, if you ask them, what would you rather be, a dog or a lion? They would say, lion, right? Even though it's a cat. Still, it's a, it's a, it's a big cat, right? Lions are strong and fierce and impressive and feared and majestic. Christ in the Bible is portrayed as a lion. Uh, dogs are different. Dogs in that culture, don't think about a, a pet dog. They were, in that culture, they were unclean, filthy, despised, ugly mongrels that ate garbage. And so, lion or dog, no brainer in that culture. No brainer. Lion, way better. Unless the lion is dead. <laughs> then it's better to be the dog. That's the point he's making. And so what he's saying here is, it's better to be alive than dead, even if you have to live in a really painful, hard, crummy, miserable condition. As hard as life might be, 
as dog-like as your life might be, death is a fate worse than life. It's better to be alive. You say, well, what about heaven? Doesn't Philippians 1 say that's better by far to go and be with Christ? Yes, it does. Is Solomon contradicting, contradicting that here? No, no, we've seen all through the book. He's, he's talking about life under the sun. He's not talking about the afterlife. He's only talking about this life, which is, a, which is a good thing to remember. You know, every time you see that phrase, life under the sun, that phrase under the sun in this book, uh, appreciate that because, you know, it's a good thing to... to be in a, in a path through life that has to do with not just the afterlife, but also this life. You know, my dad, when he was a teenager, he was told, uh, you should become a Christian, and the reason is, is so you can go to heaven when you die. And, you know, when you're a teenager, death seems like a long way off, and his attitude was, I'll get to that eventually, but for now, I want to enjoy this life. And so he didn't, he didn't become a Christian. And... Um, uh, I, I heard just recently a preacher, a famous preacher, who, who he said the same thing. When he was a teenager, he said, why should I become a Christian? So you can go to heaven when you die. And so he walked away from the church and never came back for decades because um, he thought, well, that's, that's a long way off. And what we, one of the things we find out in this book is God's way has impact on us for eternity and for the next life, yes, but it also speaks to this life. God's way is the best way here and now, in this life. It's the best path towards joy. And that's the, that's the thing. It's great to have one book of the Bible that just totally focuses on this life. Um, if you live for God's pleasure, then your life, here and now, can be filled with joy. And so much so that it's worth staying alive, if you can. Now, people who attempt suicide wouldn't agree with that. They think that if your living conditions get bad enough, or if your life becomes painful enough, uh, it's better to be a dead lion than a live dog. If your life is like a dog's life, it's better to be, a, be dead. But the preacher says, no, that's not true. It's better to stay alive, no matter what your life is like. And the reason that he gives why it's better to stay alive is actually kind of a shock. It's not what we'd expect at all. It's in verse 5. Here's why it's better to be alive than dead. Verse 5. For the living know that they will die, but the dead don't know anything. <laughs> That's the benefit of being alive, knowing that I'm doomed? I, that, why is knowing that I'm going to die such a great benefit that it's worth living a really hard, dog-like life just to have it? Well, the reason is because when you understand the reality of death, then you understand that as long as you're still alive, things can change. And the reality of death coming motivates you to change then. That's why he says in verse 4, there's hope for whoever is joined with all the living. If you still have a pulse, then there's hope that things can be different, things can change. But once you die, verse 5, there's no longer any reward for them because the memory of them is forgotten. That word reward probably refers to earning a wage. You can't work, uh, and before long, you're just forgotten. You're just forgotten. Right now, there's a place for you in this life where you fit, and, 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 and there's a group of people who know you, and they think about you, and they care. They're aware of whether you're alive or dead, and they care about whether you're alive or dead. hundred years from now, that won't be the case. you just be forgotten. Right now, your emotions, your love, and your hate, they matter, and, and, and they have an impact on people. But when you're dead, verse 4, their love, their hate, their envy have already disappeared, and there's no longer a portion for them in all that is done under the sun. So, everybody's going to die and be forgotten. So, what's the conclusion? Therefore, what? Same as always. You can guess it. He keeps bringing this up. Every section ends the same way. Uh, verse 7. Go, Therefore, go, eat your bread with pleasure, and drink your wine with a cheerful heart, for God has already accepted your works. Let the awareness of oncoming death help you enjoy God's temporal gifts along the way, reminding you that those gifts are temporary so that you need to enjoy them right now. They're going to come to an end, so enjoy them while you can. That's the point. See, people who put death out of their mind, they don't want to think about it. They don't want to think about the grave. They don't want to think about life ending. They don't want to think about how old they're getting. They just kind of put that out of their mind. Very often, they become discontent with life because what happens is they start living for the future all the time. Everything, they're always looking for, towards the future when things will be better, and, and they fail to enjoy what can be enjoyed right here and now. 
But uh, thinking about death will enable you to, to appreciate right now. Um, so he's, he tells us all this stuff to enjoy. He starts with food and drink. Enjoy food and drink because God has already accepted your works. What works? Well, the works that he just mentioned, the enjoyment of food and drink, and, and, and the various uh, temporal gifts in life that God gives us. God has already given his approval for that in his word, in scripture. Genesis 9.3, everything that, lies, uh, that lives and moves will be for food for you. Just as I gave you the green plants, now I give you everything. So, uh, 1 Timothy 6.17, God richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. So the enjoyment of God's temporal gifts already has God's stamp of approval in Scripture. He's already approved that. He said that's good. They're not guilty pleasures. They're godly pleasures. He wants us to enjoy them. Now, that's not to say we have a green light to enjoy them in any way that we want. There's wrong ways to enjoy God's gifts. Um, enjoyment of food is approved by God, but gluttony is a perversion of that. Enjoyment of money is approved by God, but greed and love of money is a perversion of that. Enjoyment of sex, that's approved by God, but outside of marriage, it's a perversion. God designed each one of his gifts to be enjoyed a certain way, and that way can't be improved upon. Um, when we try to improve upon it, we try to enjoy God's gifts in some other way uh, by abusing that gift, then it can be hard to recover, and we can put ourselves in a position where we have to back away from that thing. So there are some people who have tried to enjoy alcohol the wrong way, and now they're to the point where they, can, they have to never take another sip. There are some people, because of the, what they've done with food, now they have to stay away from unhealthy foods for a while. There are some people who, in order to follow Christ right now, honestly, they just need to get rid of their TV or lock it up for a year or something. Every one of us has to say no to certain pleasures, right? Certain earthly pleasures when they get in the way of higher goals in service in, uh, of our king in his kingdom, right? Um, living the Christian life involves a great deal of self-denial all the time. There's lots of times when we have to say no to fleshly pleasures because of some higher priority. That's the Christian life. But when we do that, when we have self-denial, it's never just self-denial for the sake of self-denial as if there were some virtue in that. There's always a reason for it. And where there's no reason, then the normal response to God's gifts is to enjoy them. That's why he gives them to us. Enjoy uh, them within the boundaries of the way that he designed us to enjoy them um, and do that with food and drink and not just food and drink but all the, all the various gifts of life verse 8 let your clothes be white all the time and never let oil be lacking on your head white clothes in that culture were difficult to keep white uh, and so they didn't wear them much they didn't wear them to work they pretty much reserved them for parties just times of festivity they're party clothes so in our culture, this would be like saying, put on your tuxedos and evening gowns and dance the night away. That's basically what he's saying. Or for some of you, maybe it's cowboy boots and a giant buckle. <laughs> However you dress up for a party, whatever you think of as a party, uh, put on your party clothes. And I should say, if, you, if at this point you're thinking of, you're imagining some kind of a context where people are getting drunk and there's revelry and immorality and all that kind of thing, if that's what comes to your mind, you maybe need to perform a factory reset on your understanding of what partying is. Because I can tell you, God invented partying. It's his idea. Partying is for the celebration and remembering and enjoying of God through the enjoyment of his people and his gifts. And that's what partying is supposed to be. The world's not interested in that. They're not interested in God, and so they invent a perverse counterfeit uh, kind of party that ignores God and abuses his gifts, uh, and that we need to avoid. Any kind of partying that leaves you with less delight in God, less desire for his word, less enthusiasm about spiritual things, less uh, longing for heaven, uh, any, the, any, any kind of partying like that is a perversion of partying, counterfeit partying, and should be absolutely avoided at all costs. That's bad. But godly partying um, is good because it will... Increase your delight in God and your delight in his people and his word and all those things. So put on your party clothes and put some oil on your head. Now oil uh, on your head in that culture was refreshment. Just think of, just refresh, you know, it, that's how they got freshened up. That's how they just made themselves feel better when they were uh, uh, getting ready for some things. It, also ha it was also 
scented, so it, was, it had the role of perfume or cologne. We do all these little things, lotions and cologne and perfume, all these little things we do to our body to just to, to, to make, make ourselves feel better, and we put on clothes that make us feel good. You know, some clothes make you feel good, some clothes make you feel not so good. Um, and and as, as long as those things don't get out of balance in your priorities in life above spiritual things, they're approved by God. They have God's approval. And that's good to know, because some people think, some people seem to think that true religion, uh, it means you have to walk around looking like you're about to die. You know, you gotta, you, you, the Pharisees used to do that. They would fast, and they would, when they fasted, not only would they fast, but they wouldn't put any oil on their head, they wouldn't do the normal hygiene so that they walked around looking haggard and disheveled, because they thought that's what really spiritual people look like. Look how religious I am. I, I look like a corpse. You know, that's the way they thought. That's wrong. Enjoy good food and nice clothes and oil and lotion and all that. Uh, the stuff that you can afford. And, and, and work especially hard at enjoying people and relationships. That's the next thing. Verse 9. Enjoy life with the wife you love all the days of your fleeting life, which has been given to you under the sun, all your fleeting days, for that is your portion in life and in your struggle under the sun. So much of the enjoyment of life that God intends for us comes through relationships. Love relationships. Now, do relationships cause pain? Yes. All love relationships cause pain. In fact, the, the, the more you love, the sharper the pain, right? Sharper the pain. Pain is sharper, but the joy is deeper. The more you love, the deeper the joy. And you, you, you might be thinking, yeah, I understand that. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. I'd rather go without that deep joy so that I can protect myself from the sharp pain. Maybe you've weighed it out and you've had crises in relationships. You're like, it is not worth the heartache. Well, if that's how you feel, then God right here is basically saying, you're wrong. You're just wrong. We have our ideas of what would make us happiest in this path through life. What, what's the best path towards happiness? And God has his ideas of what the best path towards joy would be in life. And which one are we going to follow? And the answer is, it depends on who you trust more. That's always the issue in, in Christianity. Who are you going to trust more, yourself or God? And God says, it's worth it. It's worth it to go through the heartache and the pain involved of relationships in order to have the profound love. That's the path towards deepest joy. And this principle applies to all kinds of love relationships, but the most specific application he gives here is marriage. The marriage relationship is especially holy, especially sacred and important because it's the one that illustrates the relationship between Christ and the church. And so if you're married, uh, that's the first place to put this into practice because that's the greatest aspect of your testimony and it's, it's the thing that dominates your life, right? It dominates your life, it, doesn't it? I mean, when marriage seems right, it seems like almost nothing can be wrong. It seems like you could, just, you could just conquer the world. You could face anything if your marriage is really, really good. But when your marriage is wrong, it seems like nothing can be right. I mean, to some degree, all of the sweetness of life is spoiled. Everything good in life gets kind of sour when your marriage is bad. And so it's absolute insanity to keep it that way, if you, have, if you can do anything about it. Don't forfeit God's gifts. He intended you to have joy in your marriage. Don't forfeit that. There are uh, singles in this church who would give their right arm to, to be able to share a bed with someone tonight. They'd give their right arm to have someone every evening to have dinner with and to talk about their day uh, with each night. And, and they're living alone, and for them it's an excruciating loneliness because they, they long for a spouse, but God hasn't provided one at this time. But for you, if you're married, he has. Don't squander that. If you got someone to enjoy dinner with, but the last several days or weeks or months, you have forfeited that pleasure because you haven't tended that garden to keep that love alive, or because you won't humble yourself and reconcile, or because you won't seek out another couple to, to help you get past an impasse, or because you won't let go of some area of selfishness in your heart, or because you're not conforming to God-ordained roles within the marriage, or a host of other possible reasons. One way or another, God has provided you an opportunity to enjoy life with your spouse, and the opportunity is being squandered. 
Now, not always. Sometimes you're doing everything you can and your spouse just won't reconcile, and that's different. But if you have the power to reconcile with your spouse, do it. Do whatever it takes. Because God's given you that gift. He's given you somebody to crawl in bed with each night. And you're not taking advantage of it. You have someone whose day that you could brighten with a hug and a kiss in the morning and a smile, and you're not taking advantage of it. Enjoy your spouse. Spend time together as friends. Prize each other as lovers. Value your wife as a person. Find out what our greatest fears are and our greatest desires are and our greatest hopes and, and, and dreams and explore her heart. You know, the heart of a woman is not an easy thing to understand, but it's a fascinating thing to explore. And wives, for the, for the, find out the, those things that God put in your husband that God intended to be admired and admire them. Enjoy them. Search them out. You might have to dig a little, but find them and, and admire them. Enjoy your spouse. And then one more application. Your work. Verse 10. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your strength, because there is no work, planning, knowledge, or wisdom in Sheol where you are going. Enjoy your food, enjoy your clothes, enjoy your wife, and enjoy your work. Whatever your work is, whether you're in, in education or the arts or science or transportation or food preparation or management or HR or janitorial or interior design or fashion or finance or medicine or whatever it is, or if you've got the one job that requires all of those, homemaker, um, whatever your task, get into it. Just dive in. Take this job and love it. Learn to enjoy your work. You say, but uh, I'm just working like a dog. Well... Better a live dog than a dead lion, right? You're alive. Act like it. Celebrate life. That's the message of this chapter. Basically, you're alive, act like it. You have the gift of life. And, and part of that gift is the gift of work. Work is opportunity. Do you know that? Your work is all opportunity. Raise your hand if you have arms and legs. Okay, most of you. <laughs> you know what those are? You know what those arms and legs are? Opportunity. Those are opportunity. You can do things with arms and legs and, and mouths and brains. You can do things. You can accomplish things that change the way things are and, and bring about outcomes that wouldn't otherwise happen. You, you, your ability to work is an opportunity, which is why even painful Hard life, uh, life is better than death because uh, as soon as you die, that opportunity is gone. In this life, there's lots of opportunity to do things that will impact eternity forever, things that can't be changed once you die. And so when you die, that opportunity goes away. Every bit of reward that you ever accumulate in this life, for all of eternity, you're going to be so glad you did it. You're going to be so glad, you're going to say, oh, I'm so glad I didn't squander that. I'm glad I seized that opportunity. So staying in this world, remaining in this hard, painful life is a good thing. It's a good thing. Unless you think that that's just kind of a sub-Christian, pre-cross sort of weird thing out of Ecclesiastes. Jesus said the same thing. John 9, 4. He said, we must do the works of him who sent me while it's still day, because night is coming when no one can work. There's an urgency. Time is coming when you will work your last day. And, and knowledge of that should serve to motivate us to really work hard while we can. The fact that, that work and planning and knowledge and wisdom uh, and all of that will come to an end should make us zealous to work and plan and exercise knowledge and utilize wisdom and to use that while we can. Every time you do that, every time you use knowledge, every time you do something that's wiser than some other thing, Every time you act like a human being and not an animal, every time you do that, that's a privilege. The opportunity to do that is a gift from God. We don't always recognize that as one of God's gifts, one of the great joys of life, uh, but it is. You know, when we count our blessings, uh, when we're, we're Thanksgiving Day and you're going around the table and everybody's saying, oh, I'm thankful for this, thankful for that, um, Typically, we don't think of this. We say, I'm thankful for you know, my health and for my friends and for my family. I'm thankful for, for provision and, and all that. But how often do we say, you know what? The one thing I'm really grateful to God for, I'm so thankful that I have this opportunity to use 
knowledge and wisdom. See, when you were a kid, you longed for that. Uh, when you were a kid, you couldn't really do much. Everything was done for you. Everything was decided for you. Nothing you did had any real impact on anything. You couldn't make anything that really mattered. You couldn't do, drive anywhere. You couldn't solve any real significant problems. You just mainly created them. That's what it's like to be a kid. And, and every kid longs to grow up and, and get to where they can do real things, right? They want to do real things, things that actually matter. For a while, they're content to just push the little plastic mower behind Dad uh, out in the yard. But after a while, they realize, this thing, it's not cutting anything. It's not doing anything. I want something real. And they long to grow up so they can have what you have, the ability to do things that matter. Each one of you has a spiritual gift. You've been, if you're a believer, you've been given a spiritual gift by the Holy Spirit. And, and, and you have these various past experiences and knowledge and perspectives on things that no one else has. Nobody can do these things like you can do them. You have a unique kind of wisdom that you can apply to dealing with the issues of life that nobody else has quite like you do. And the ability to use that wisdom and that knowledge and those gifts, the fact that every day you can take all of these resources God has given you and apply them and make real decisions that have real outcomes, even on eternity, that's a gift from God. That's something to celebrate. But the opportunity to do it is, is, in this life is a short-term thing that can come to an end. It's for a limited time only. And it's, you're not always going to have it. So work hard. Work hard. Don't take a, a half-baked tentative, reluctant, halting, fits and stops kind of approach to life. Don't, don't go through life hogtied by people's expectations and critiques. You know, going around and you're only tentative about everything. Oh, I better not go too far this way or they'll get mad. I better not do too much of this. They'll get mad. I gotta make them happy, them happier. Pretty soon you're, you're, you can do nothing because, because nobody's happy with every... I mean, you can't, there's nothing you do to make everyone happy. And so you're, you're so you're so bound up by expectations that you can't Pour yourself into anything. The Apostle Paul called us to work hard again and again through the New Testament. He gave us the example. Basically called it, he said, use your best judgment, find out what God wants you to do, and just pour yourself into it. And he talked about his hard work all the time. As an example, Acts 20, verse 35. He says, in everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak. And he, that word hard work, it refers to becoming weary, just laboring to the point of fatigue. And he, he re used that word, referring to himself all the time. And when he saw that, in, that virtue in someone else, he, he, he took note of it. And he drew attention to it. Romans 16, 6, he says, Greet Mary, who worked very hard for you. And verse 12, Greet Tryphena and Tryphosa, these women who work hard in the Lord. And greet my dear friend Paresis, who, another woman who has worked very hard in the Lord. I don't know if any of the men in Rome were doing anything, but these women were working hard. <laughs> hard work in the Lord is a great virtue, but... For us, it's a struggle because in a wealthy culture like ours, we just, we just become lazy. It's so easy to become lazy. We've invented this 40-hour work week thing, which is just a total uh, American thing. It's not anything in the Bible. When Jesus made up a story about a guy who worked a full day's work for a fair day's wage, it was a 12-hour day, a work day. And then later in the story, there's a guy who only works nine hours, and he's envied because he gets a whole day's wage for only a partial day's work. He only worked nine hours. That's the biblical model, but we've created a situation where people are ready to go on strike because they have to go from 8 o'clock to noon without a coffee break sometimes. Laziness is one of those enemies that we just have to fight off all day long. Every, all of us do, don't we? Even if you work a lot of hours, you, 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 during those hours, you, you, you're working, you face some really hard problem, and what do we want to do? We want to just say, I'll take a break from that and do something easy. And we just turn, turn, we want to turn and do something easy. Every time we run into a, a, a roadblock, some insurmountable thing, we're just like, ah, I'm going to take a break from that and do something easy. And if you give in to that, if you let yourself... Um, once something becomes monotonous or difficult to, to just kind of veer off to something easier, um, if you get into a habit of doing that, what will happen eventually is you'll just get so your whole life becomes just a sluggish, lame, half-hearted attempt at living. And, and, and that might work if you had unlimited years, but you don't. 
That's his point here. Time is short, so figure out what you're supposed to do and roll up your sleeves and enjoy pouring all your ingenuity and effort and wisdom and knowledge and skill and strength into it and get it done. And do it now because many of those gifts are only for this life. They only, they're only for now. Earthly pleasures that God gives us to enjoy in this life, aren't even gonna, a lot of them aren't even going to exist in heaven, like marriage. You know that um, your marriage is like those tickets that you get when you play skee-ball at Elitch's, where you get the little, you know, you get the thing and you get the little tickets and then you can turn them in for the toys uh, in the store. Those things are, have value for getting those toys while you're in that arcade. As soon as you leave the arcade, they're worthless, right? They're not good anywhere else. You'd be crazy to take those and save them up, put them in your pocket and say, well, I'm saving them up. Because as soon as you leave that arcade, they're, they're, they have no value at all. Your, your marriage, your money, your possessions, all the stuff in this life, they're only good here, just in the arcade of this little world, this life. So if you pretend death is never going to come and you postpone the use of those things uh, until it's too late, that's folly. Right now, you're alive. Act like it. Act like it. You say, but I hate my life. Well, see, that's the beauty of still being alive. Because things can change, right? While you're still alive. That's the point he made. And things will change. Which is another reason why you should enjoy what can be enjoyed right now, because time's running out on the way things are right now. Things are going to change. Whatever you find yourself doing right now, do it. Do your work as if the clock were ticking. Because it is. It is. Has is, is anybody in here ever played the game Catchphrase? Okay, Catchphrase, that's a, if you're not familiar with that, it's a party game where somebody hands you this disc that's beeping like a time bomb. And it, and, it, and it shows a word on there. You're trying to get your team to guess this word. You have to describe it and try and get them to guess before, and so that you can pass this thing off, this time bomb off to the next player uh, before the beeping stops and the buzzer goes off. Whoever's holding the buzzer, when, or that thing, when the buzzer goes off, loses the point. And the whole time you're tr that you're trying to get your team to guess, what happens is that beeping gets progressively faster and more urgent, uh, which it, it just is an indicator, time's running out. And the, the kicker is this, that thing is not consistent from turn to turn. So, so uh, one time it'll beep a little faster and a little faster and a little faster and a little faster and a little faster, 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 faster and it keeps going and going and, going, and it takes a, actually a long time before it finally the buzzer goes off. And then the next turn it'll beep uh, just a couple times faster and boom, and the buzzer goes off. So it's impossible to, to predict how much time is left, but that increasing speed of the beeping it reminds you that the buzzer could just go off at any second and your hopes for winning that point could be dashed forever. So that's the game. And the faster that thing beeps, the more urgency that you feel. And what the preacher's telling us here is life, this life, it's like a game of catchphrase. The clock is ticking, and at any moment that buzzer could go off, and, and, and it could be over. Death could come. You could die at any time. And even if you don't die, things could, some random calamity in this fallen, cursed world could happen and just put the kibosh on whatever it is you're trying to do right now. And that's verse 11. That's where he goes next. He says, again, I saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, nor bread to the wise, or riches to the discerning, or favor to the skillful. Rather, time and chance happen to all of them. Time and chance happen to you. Even if you're really strong and really smart, and really skilled, and really wise, there are a couple of game changers that can just happen uh, to you and change everything, and that is time and chance. First time. I don't know if you've ever thought about time as something that happens to you, but it is. It, it happens to you, right? You can't do anything about it. You can't control it. You can't stop it. You can't escape it. Some wonderful thing is happening in your life. You're like, man, I want this to last forever. I wish time would stop so I could just enjoy it, but it won't stop. It never stops. It always comes to an end, this thing that you're enjoying. You see your kids growing up faster than you wish they would grow up, and you want to, you, you want to save this time, but it won't. They just keep growing up. The clock never stops. The future just keeps arriving and arriving and arriving into the present all the time, and you never know what it's going to bring. The one thing you do know that it'll bring is change, right? It's going to change, very often change for the worse, and that's the other thing that happens to everybody. Chance. Chance happens. Now, chance, of course, this is speaking only from the human perspective. Chance doesn't happen to God. There's no such thing as chance from God's perspective, because... Um, he, everything from God's perspective, he, he controls everything, he knows everything, he's aware of everything, nothing surprises him. But from our point of view, there are all kinds of things that 
don't, we don't, they don't seem to have any rhyme or reason. God knows the purpose of them, but we don't. We don't see any purpose. We don't see any connections with other things. Some things we see the connections, right? We, they make sense to us. We can put it together. Somebody goes skiing in an avalanche area right after a big snowstorm and triggers an avalanche and gets, gets caught up and, and is killed. And to us, that we, that, we can make sense of that. We can, we can connect the dots there, right? And say, well, that, I, can, I can see that. But you hear about a woman that just goes for a walk to walk her dog in the park and nearby uh, uh, interstate, a wheel comes off, off a semi and bounces down into the park and hits her and kills her. That's just, that just seems so fluky and random out of the blue, you know? And what the preacher's saying here is fluky, inexplicable, unpredictable things happen to all of us. They happen. Now, they happen more often to fools than they do to to wise people, but they still happen to everyone. God is the author of life, and in him we live and move and have our being, and he gives us all kinds of gifts along the way, but those gifts, they can only be enjoyed for a, a, a time, and, and you need to enjoy them now because Time and chance are going to just pop up out of the blue and some fluky random thing is going to happen that's going to bring that opportunity to an end. And it can happen at any moment. If you're, the, if you're running a race and you're the fastest runner, you better run as fast as you can at the beginning of the race because you never know. Some weird thing could happen halfway through the race that's going to slow you down and the slow guy ends up beating you. And again, he reminds us, death Death can come at any moment too, verse 12. For man certainly does not know his time. Like fish caught in a cruel net, or like birds caught in a trap, so people are trapped in an evil time as suddenly falls on them. So what are you doing right now in your life? What are you involved with? Maybe you're teaching a class. Clock is ticking. Buzzer could go off at any moment. You could get blindsided by something out of the blue that would make it so that this next session that you're teaching is the last thing you'll ever teach to this group. And so, make it count. Make it count. That's the point. Do you have the opportunity to love your spouse right now? Get, it, get on with it. Get it done. Get, it, get, it, get after it before time and chance strike and the opportunity is gone. Are you in school at this time? Don't say, ah, I hate school. I can't, I can't wait till I graduate. If school is where God has you right now, now is what counts. Enjoy God's gifts. He's got a lot of gifts for you along the way, right here and now, in school. God's gifts, His grace just rains down like raindrops. And I'm telling you, it's pouring rain out. All you have to do is look up and open your mouth, and you can get it. There are things in your life now, whatever your situation is, that can be enjoyed if you are willing, and, and part of enjoying those things involves just throwing yourself wholeheartedly at your task with all your strength. It's impossible to enjoy swimming, uh, the swimming pool, by just sticking your toe in. You can't do that. To get the joy of that, the enjoyment of that thing, you've got to take the plunge. And if you keep hesitating, before you know it, time and chance are going to strike, and the, it'll be too late. And not only can time and chance come and death come, um, but sinful people can pop up and foul things up. That's another part of the curse. And he illustrates that starting in verse 13. He tells an interesting story here. He says, I have observed that uh, this is also wisdom under the sun, and it is significant to me. There was a small city with a few men in it. A great king came against it and surrounded it and built large siege works against it. Now a poor wise man was found in this city, and he delivered the city by his wisdom. And yet no one remembered that poor man. So the point there is, um, even wisdom, this world, they won't appreciate it. Now that's an interesting little parable, because I think Solomon, I think that principle is something that Solomon learned around age 10. He's, Solomon was about 10, 12 years old, uh, and something almost identical to this happened in Israel. There was a town in Israel called Abel, and uh, it was about to be destroyed by Solomon's dad, King David. And they had the siege works and everything. They were about to just crush this city. And at the last minute, a very wise woman stepped forward and used her wisdom to just 
avert the whole thing, head the whole thing off, and, and the battle never even took place. Joab talked talk to this woman, and then after talking to her, he was satisfied, he packed up his stuff, turned around, told, told the whole army, let's go, and they went home at, without firing a single shot. You say, how did you do it? Well, I'll let you read that. It's 2 Samuel 20. I don't have time to get into it. Um, but you can read it in 2 Samuel 20. I, I, all I'll say about the story is this, something that I want to point out that's very interesting as I was reading it this week. The thing that's so fascinating about that account is all the names that are provided, all these characters, there's lots of characters in this story, and, and they're all named and, and, and recorded in Scripture except one. The, we have, the, in that account it mentions David, Abishai, Joab, Sheba, the Carathites, the Pelethites, the Bikri, uh, Amasa, and, and, and then several others at the, at the end. All these names, all these people are named in the account, even though some of them, they didn't hardly do anything in the account. Like a massa. All he does is get stabbed in the stomach by Joab and dies on the road, and they have to drag him out of, out of the road. That's it. That's his only role. Um, or Bickery. He really doesn't do anything. He doesn't even show up. He's just someone's dad. He's, he's Sheba's father. Sheba's son of Bickery. And yet his name is recorded. All the names of all the characters, major and minor, are recorded in this event. They're, they were remembered, except one the woman. We don't know who she was. The woman whose wisdom saved the whole city. Just kind of forgotten who she was. I think you know, she might have been queen for a day, and then they just sort of forgot about her. And that's, that's really illustrative of how, the, that's just the way things go in life. Wisdom's just simply not appreciated in this world. No one is famous in our culture for being wise, right? Who's famous for being wise? I mean, lots of people are famous for their strength. A boxer who can knock out all the other boxers but can't form a coherent sentence will be paid millions of dollars and honored and remembered for, you know, decades. But of all the celebrities in our culture and all the heroes and the famous people, who's famous for their great wisdom? I mean, we know, we know who the strongest are in the world, the fastest, the richest, the sexiest. We know all these lists. We know the most educated. Uh, but have you ever seen a ma magazine article, the, the top ten wisest people? You just don't, uh, it's just not something our culture values that much. But they should, because wisdom is better than strength. That's verse 16. I said, wisdom is better than strength, because the wisdom of the poor man is despised, and, uh, or but the wisdom of the poor man is despised, and his words are not heeded. So wisdom, it's better than strength, because it can save you when you don't have strength. It can save you times when you're outgunned, outnumbered, overmatched. Um, wisdom can do that. Wisdom's valuable. If you're distressed over uh, the fact that you don't have, you know, you're not the one in charge. You know, last week we talked about authority and submission. And some of you said, man, I wish I was in charge. If I were president, I would do this. And if I had the power, I would do this. And, and, and you wish you were in charge, but you're not. If that bothers you, strive for wisdom, because that will give you more power, more influence than authority will. Maybe you're not the president or the governor or the boss at work. You're not in charge. Maybe you're a wife and you, you have a tough time dealing with submitting to your husband's authority and you just wish you were the one in charge of the household. If you have any anxiety at all over not being in charge, just remember this. Wisdom will give you more influence than power. Wisdom is better than power. Verse 17. The calm words of the wise are heeded more than the shouts of rulers over fools. Wisdom is better than the weapons of war. Even if you have no authority, no power, you use wisdom and you speak those words calmly, you can do more than they can do with all their shouting. You don't have to be the one in charge. All you have to do is get wisdom. And when you do, you can be calm. That's why if you ever watch a debate, you can almost always tell who's winning a debate by who's calm. Right? The one who's turning red and he's starting to yell and he's resorting to attacking his opponent and, and, and insults and all the rest. He's the one that's losing, right? He's losing. When you're wiser than your opponent, you don't have to do that. You can just be calm. Your, your, your point speaks for itself. You can just relax. Wisdom is incredibly powerful and valuable, but don't expect people to value it. Don't, don't expect your wisdom to be celebrated or appreciated or even remembered by anybody. We live in a fallen world, and so don't be surprised when your wisdom just goes totally unnoticed. And don't be surprised when the things that you accomplish with your wisdom get ruined by a fool. You know, just as he told us before, wisdom can be derailed by sin, verse 9. But one sinner can destroy much good. Dead flies make a perfumer's 
oil ferment and stink. So a little folly outweighs wisdom and honor. I mean, you can, you can just accomplish huge amounts of good with your wisdom, and one moron can ruin the whole thing. So, there's actually three things that can happen, that can, well, four that can happen. Uh, there's, uh, it, it, you need to enjoy what you're doing now, and you need to pour yourself into it because of four possible things. One is death could happen at any moment. Time and chance could happen at any moment. And fools can happen at any moment. Fools can step up and mess things over and bring your current opportunity to an end. But for now, you're alive. Act like it. Act like it. Seize the moment. Carpe diem. Right? Seize the day. Take advantage of the opportunity you have right now. Live life to beat the buzzer. That's what he's calling us to do. Enjoy your meals. Put on some party clothes and, and get dressed up and put on some perfume or cologne. Go out there and just let there be plenty of celebration in your life. God's given all this stuff to you. Use it. Plunge yourself into relationships. Don't squander the opportunity to enjoy your wife or your husband or your parents or your kids or your friends or, or, or other relationships. The clock is ticking. Do you really want to waste your life bickering with somebody and being at odds with somebody? The buzzer could go off at any second. Have you let days go by without reconciling a relationship, or weeks, or even years? Do we think we're going to live forever? We're not. Time and chance are right around the corner. Fools could strike at any moment. This opportunity could be lost. Don't waste your months. Don't waste your weeks. Don't waste your hours. And enjoy your God-given task. Do it with all your strength. Learn to enjoy using wisdom. Learn to enjoy using knowledge and using your gifts and planning and working and knowledge. We're imitating God when we do those things, aren't we? When we use wisdom and we use planning and we do that kind of stuff, we're, we're imitating God. We're doing things that animals can't do. That's part of the life God has given us. You're alive. Act like it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the gift of life and um, for the opportunities that you've given us, the countless opportunities. Lord, teach us to seize on them and to um, enjoy what you have given us to enjoy. Let us live li our lives in a way that um, the energy of our lives shows that we don't fear death. We're not a people that fears death so much that we have to cower away from it and turn our eyes away and pretend that it doesn't exist. We can look it straight in the eye and live our lives with joy because of the promises that you've given us. We pray this in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.